welcome to the Immortal Art Podcast. I'm your host Eldin. This is episode 6, The First People, The First Artists, Part 1. Before I begin, there's a Patreon link for the podcast if you want to support me. For the price of a cup of coffee per month, or a donut if you feel like it, you can help this podcast. You can cancel it whenever you want, whether the money doesn't suit your needs, or if there is an issue with your finances. No strings attached. You can find all the details on Patreon. If you haven't, make sure to subscribe and follow the podcast, so you will never miss an episode. I appreciate it. You can reach me at the Immortal Art Podcast at gmail.com. All the links are included in the episode's description. Thank you. In this episode, I shall talk about the very first artists. To explain the first artists and the origin of art, our symbolic and abstract thinking, our ability to recognize patterns, to imagine the future, or something unseen, to anticipate, to plan, I need to start from the very beginning. The origins of humans begin around 6 to 7 million years ago in East Africa. During this period, the African forest and jungles gradually transformed into savannas. The climate changed geography. This influenced evolution and reshaped Africa's landscape. New types of plant species emerged, while open grasslands attracted animals such as antelopes, zebras, gazelles, and the predators that hunt them. We are apes. We are a group of great apes together with chimps, bonobos, orangutans, and gorillas. Our family tree diverged from other apes around 7 million years ago, and through interbreeding, may be continued as long as 1 million years more. Blink of an eye in the history of our planet and the history of the cosmos. To put it in perspective, if you could compress the entire lifespan of the universe into a year, The existence of modern humans would barely account for a fraction of a second on December 31st, with early apes appearing just a second before. We share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees and bonobos. We are closer to them, in terms of genetics, than African elephant is close to an Indian elephant. We diverged from chimps and bonobos specifically between 4 and 3 million years ago. Before I continue, it is important to clarify some terminology. In Latin, the term homo means man. Hominins refers to modern humans and our relatives, while hominids include all great apes and their ancestors. When you think about the evolution of humans, It's not as simple as that famous picture of a few apes walking in a straight line. Instead, imagine the human family tree as a three-dimensional tree with branches that intertwine, extending in all possible directions. Our ancestors lived in small numbers, often with extended families or similar social structures, ranging from small family units to larger bands of approximately 20 to 50 individuals. These groups provided protection, fostering cooperation and resource sharing. Over time, this sparked compassion. While in the wild, most animals either die or become prey if injured. Hominins changed that. Our prehistoric ancestors cared for one another. Our ancestors shared everything, from food to the care of their young, even sexual partners. The prevailing narrative is that our ancestral females exchanged their sexual fidelity with males in return for resources, protection, shelter or status. In contrast, jealous males, by controlling multiple females, yes, plural, sought reassurance to the legitimacy of their offspring and actively pursued multiple sexual partners to maximize their chances of fathering many offspring. With this narrative, 
there is no room for cooperation, compassion or resource sharing within the group. The sex lives of our ancestors were depicted as deceit, despair and the odds between sexes. The famous line was born, women are from Venus, men are from Mars. No, we are all from Earth. We all have the same desires and needs. The story of one partner for life came with agriculture. The traditional family structure where the man provides and the woman stays home to care for the household and children dates back only 10 to 12,000 years. This mindset and way of living heightened the feelings of jealousy and control over partners. Monogamy is practiced by only one group of great apes, us. Early humans, especially early hominins, lacked possessions such as houses or land. They roamed freely, seeking food whenever they could find it. Their survival relied on cooperation, sharing and compassion. But how do anthropologists know that early humans and early hominins shared everything? Isn't it true that behavior leaves no record? Well, psychologists and anthropologists have observed chimpanzees and bonobos. They have also studied what we might call, air quote, primitive tribes and nomadic groups that have lived as hunter-gatherers for eons, perhaps since the dawn of humankind. The violence, the hierarchy, the social status, that's chimpanzees. They're power mad, jealous, violent, they wage war, they murder and kill, they rape, they are our violent cousins. The size of canine teeth in chimps is directly indicative of heightened aggression levels. The role of canine size is a complex combination of social status, dominance and communication. The researchers came up with conclusion that we, together with chimps, are killer apes. A five million years of aggression. The brutality of chimps and cruelty of humans are intertwined. Chimpanzees and gorillas are harem-based societies. The males fight all the time for dominance and access to females. The strongest male gets it all. All the males are about twice of size of females. Chimp males, or a chimp dominant male, use violence to get females. On the other hand, bonobos use sex to avoid violence. Unlike their ape counterparts, human females do not have genital swellings when overlating. Men do not know when women are fertile. Most likely, it was lost in early hominins. Only bonobos and we can have a will to have sex whenever desired. In other animals, across species, sexual activity serve as the primary purpose of generating offspring rather than seeking pleasure. Chimpanzees' behavior alone cannot help us understand early hominin behavior. Behaviors and societal arrangement of contemporary primates and contemporary hunter-gatherer communities can offer us insights into behavior of early hominids. The hierarchy among chimpanzees is most evident when it comes to eating. Chimpanzees cooperate when they hunt, but not share when eat. The dominant male and his closest allies eat first. In humans, bonobos, and most definitely the early hominins, as well as many hunter-gatherer societies, food is shared. Apes are born selfish, but sharing and cooperation runs deep in our DNA. Cooperation is learned. We humans do it all the time. Those among you who have children knows very well about children's selfishness and learned sharing. If mother science had learned about bonobos first, instead of chimpanzees, we would perceive our ancestors, the first hominids, as female-centered, sex-driven, cooperative, egalitarian, and above all, peaceful beings. 
we would shift our focus from warfare, violence, aggression, and male-dominant traits to discussion of peace, cooperation, caregiving, empathy, and sexuality. But we didn't. By observing chimpanzees, science concluded, including philosophy and psychology, that our ancestors were brutish, warlike, violent, and aggressive. There's a reason why. Bonobos are one of the last species of mammals to be observed in their natural habitat. They were even considered a subspecies of chimpanzees until very recent. Unlike other apes, including us, bonobos lack rigid hierarchy. Their high-ranking female is more of an influential figure than a dominant one. Her position at the top is because of affection rather than dominance. Even the term hierarchy can be misleading as ranks among females bonobos are based on seniority. The high-ranking female bonobo don't use her power like other apes do. There is no male submission to dominant female. Whenever females are in charge, males are better off. Due to the struggle for power, chimpanzees males have higher stress levels than bonobo males. The high-ranking female bonobo is more of a bonobo mother figure to everyone. I don't know how to express it better. The high-ranking female bonobo raised or helped raise all the younger generations. There is a big similarities between bonobos and us. Young bonobos and humans develop much later than other apes. Bonobos and humans have more childhood than the rest of apes. Bonobos and humans enter sexual maturity later than the rest of apes. Bonobos, humans, and most likely the early hominins are the only species of apes known to possess what scientists refer to as repetitive microsatellite or nature ecstasy. We know it as oxytocin. Bonobos engaged in sex to stimulate food sharing, reduce stress, and reaffirm friendships. Like humans, bonobos hold hands, gaze into each other's eyes during coitus, and even engage in a French kissing. The bonobo's vulva is positioned more towards the front, as in humans, compared to chimps. Human sexual behavior shares more similarities with bonobos than with any other creature on Earth, making them a suitable model for understanding the behavior of our ancestors. Homosexuality is common in bonobos and humans, but rare in chimps. Indeed, the discussion about human evolution, it makes me wonder, would be different if we had encountered bonobos first instead of chimps. Why am I telling you all of this? Sexuality in apes, including us, is evolutionary trait of bonding. To bond, you have to have empathy. To have an empathy, you need to understand emotions. To understand emotions, you need to communicate. To communicate, you need to have abstract thoughts and abstract feelings. That's art. Of course, the reality is more complex. Artistic expression can enhance communication and emotional understanding, yet bonding, empathy, and communication extend beyond art. I'm only trying to paint the picture, no pun intended. The earliest known hominin is Artipithecus, dating back 4.4 million years ago. Adipithecus means ape of Ardi. Their height was around 19 centimeters. Adipithecus was the first hominin to walk on two legs, but still used its hands for running and climbing, similar to chimpanzees or bonobos. Adipithecus shares strong physical similarities with chimpanzees, but factors like canine size suggest that Adipithecus exhibit a reduced aggression, aligning them more closely with the traits of bonobos. Their skeletal structure indicates a blend of ape-like and human-like features, providing insights into bipedalism and adaption to both tree-dwelling and ground-dwelling environments. 
Australopithecus, Latin term for southern ape, had a relatively small brain, approximately 20% size of modern human brains, similar to one of bonobos and chimpanzees. Their height was around 120 centimeters. Interestingly, bipedalism, or walking on the two legs, appeared before the development of larger brains, showcasing a separate evolutionary path. In terms of diet, they were omnivores. Their diet was even adaptable for various food sources, which helped them survive during periods of scarcity. They displayed creativity by using large stones to hunt small animals such as rats and lizards. Their diet also included fruits and insects. Australopithecus had 32 teeth, with canines and molars similar to modern humans, making them direct ancestors of Homo genus. A well-preserved Australopithecus afarensis fossil, or the southern ape of the Afar region in Ethiopia, where it was found in 1970s, provided crucial insights into early human evolution. The female fossil was named Lucy, after the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles, which was playing at the campsite on the night of her discovery. I don't know how to pronounce her name. It's French. Elisabeth Dainé. She's known for her skill in crafting lifelike reconstructions of prehistoric humans based on scientific evidence and research. Elizabeth's sculptures create a connection between the viewer and creation, bridging the gap of ages and linking us to our ancestors. I will include a link to her paleo art webpage in the description of this episode. Check it out. Paranthropus, meaning close to man, lived between 2.7 and 1 million years ago in East Africa, primarily in Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania with some fossils found in South Africa. These hominins, characterized by their skull crest as in the modern chimps, possessed robust jaw muscles and large molar teeth, suited for tough plant-based diet. Their height was 130 centimeters. While related to us, they are not direct ancestors and they coexisted with Australopithecus, Homo habilis and Homo erectus in woodlands Paranthropus practice polygamy, making them relevant to this episode. Homo habilis was the earliest Homo genus member. They emerged around 2.8 million years ago. Homo habilis walked upright, but they were not adapted for running. They had an average height of 140 centimeters. Their fossils were discovered in East Africa, in modern-day Tanzania and Kenya. The Homo habilis means handyman, and they were the first hominins to use stone and bone tools. Those tools were crafted for hunting rather than warfare. Only we, as a product of agrarian societies, are preoccupied with warfare, violence and female fidelity. By the way, the entire period from approximately the appearance of Homo habilis to very recent around 10,000 years ago, is referred as Paleolithic or Old Stone Age. A species that directly led to our own lineage is Homo erectus, or upright man. They had a large brain, and these hominins were using sophisticated tools. They emerged around 1.8 million years ago, approximately a million years after Homo habilis. Homo erectus was the first to involve a truly human-like body shape. The average height of Homo erectus was around 160 centimeters. Homo erectus was the first to use fire for cooking and warmth. The use of fire was probably accidental discovery. I imagine a black night in the African savannas. The moon peers through clouds after a thunderstorm, the sole source of light. A gathering of Homo erectus individuals encircles a thunderstuck tree. 
They're captivated by the lingering blaze within its hollow trunk. The smell of burnt wood and leaves fills the air. Driven by both curiosity and instinct, one brave member of the group cautiously prods a stick into the tree's glowing heart. Fire catches on the stick, and the newfound brilliance dances before their eyes. The group watches in awe while this flickering force of nature illuminates the darkness. Drawn to the warmth of flames, they gather closer. They feel the contrast between cool night air and the gentle warmth of the flames. Maybe some of them want to touch it and they burn themselves. They begin to experiment, picking up smaller branches and leaves to feed the fire. The fire grows. They're fascinated by it. Over generations, the knowledge of fire spreads within the Homo erectus community. They learn to carry embers, preserving this vital resource as they migrate to new lands. Fire becomes a cornerstone of their existence, passed down from elders to youth, shaping their and our evolution. Homo erectus' mastery of fire marked a profound shift in human evolution. They transcended the limitation of their environment. This control of fire, not just igniting it, but also sustaining it for various purposes, brought significant changes. Cooking helps digestion, initiating it before food even enters our mouths. Cooked meat influenced brain growth and social behavior among Homo erectus. With the larger brains and the warmth of fire, their social dynamics likely underwent changes. Who carried the fire? Who maintained it? Did they have rituals? Who was the closest to the fire? Homo erectus evolved into a species capable of introspection and self-awareness. The discovery of fire paves the way for advancement in technology, society, and the trajectory of our species. They are no longer solely at the mercy of their environment. They now hold the power to shape it. As Homo erectus expand beyond Africa, they venture to distant corners of the world, setting the stage for human expansion. In the shadows of history, the mastery of fire illuminated a journey that will forever change our path. Consider it as one of the most significant discoveries ever made. Ultimately, control over fire in the last 60 years enabled us to reach the moon and explore the solar system and the cosmos. In Israeli Evran Quarry, Evidence of controlled fire dating back at least one million years has been uncovered. This discovery was made possible with the help of artificial intelligence, which identified subtle signs of stone burning by early hominins. The evidence indicate a cooking fire with temperatures ranging from 300 to 500 degrees Celsius, eliminating natural causes. This placed Homo erectus as a main suspect. All mammals have fur. It's an ancient feature. Fur varies in thickness depending on location. It provides warmth in cold climates and shields from heat in UV lights in warm climates. In the African savanna, animals rest in the shade of trees while hunting mostly at night. Some animals sweat a little too, but it makes them lose water an impractical evolutionary trait in warmer climates. But why did we evolve skin only to wear fur from other animals? The disappearance of fur from our ancestors took place over millions of years. Homo erectus, with their long legs and bipedalism, engaged in persistence hunting, chasing prey until it collapsed from exhaustion. Less fur? allowed efficient sweating and faster cooling during hunt. But did we start running and then lose the fur? Or did we lose the fur and that allow us to run? What is older, 
the chicken or the egg. The answer is evolution. Australopithecus and early hominins couldn't survive the night without fur. Homo erectus controlled fire, staying warm through the night. This brings me to the pigmentation of the skin. Darker skin would protect Homo erectus from the sun. If you observe chimps or bonobos, their exposed skin is darker than the skin underneath the fur. DNA shows the darker skin existed at least 1.2 million years ago. Dark skin gradually replaced fur as more successful hunters passed on their genes. In the same time, we start to sweat. Chimps and bonobos do sweat under their armpits, but the sweatiest apes are humans. Yes, we still have fur, or as we call it, hair on our bodies. We are covered in almost microscopic tiny hairs. The fur, or hair on our head, protects our scalps from solar radiation and keeps our brains cool. Pubic and armpit hair is there to announce sexual maturity. Sweat contains hormones and pheromones carrying information about individuals. The scent of sweat can be attractive or repulsive, depending on sexual preferences. There is another aspect about our ancestors. They might have consumed hallucinogenic mushrooms, but it's more of a hypothesis proposed by Terence McKenna in his 1992 book, Food of the Gods. He claims that introducing psilocybin mushrooms into the human diet played a role into transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, contributing to the cognitive revolution. However, it is important to note that the scientific community has rejected the Stone Ape theory. But I find it interesting. Hallucinogenic mushrooms, such as Salocybe cubensis, can be found in various regions of Africa, particularly in tropical and subtropical areas. All apes have consumed and continue to consume mushrooms. Maybe, just maybe, as the African savanna expanded, our primate ancestors that emerged from the jungle discovered magic mushrooms in the excrement of large animals. These hallucinogenic mushrooms could have influenced their cognitive development, potentially playing a role in the emergence of certain aspects of consciousness. There is a limited direct evidence to support this hypothesis, and we may never definitely prove or disprove it. It's intriguing speculation, and it's a fun concept to contemplate. Imagine, in the heart of lush and ancient jungle, an ape discovers a mushroom. Hungry or intrigued by its colors, the ape takes a bite. The ape goes back on the tree. As the sun dips below the horizon, the jungle and savanna around the ape seems to transform. Geometric patterns are in the leaves, in the trees, in the sky and the distant sounds of savannas and forest melts into a harmonious symphony of sounds. The ape senses are heightened, and the world becomes rich with color, interconnected with geometric shapes. Generation pass, and the knowledge of this mystical mushroom is passed down. Other apes join in the experience, and over time, communication becomes more intricate as they attempt to share and describe to each other, and to themselves, in the best way they can, these profound experiences. They become more empathic. Centuries go by, the tradition continues, with each generation building up on the collective knowledge of those that came before. Eventually, this altered state of mind and perception, this heightened senses of communication begins to influence the ape's creativity. They become more empathic, more braver. The experience gradually becomes intertwined with the apes' everyday lives. Concept of unity, empathy, and shared consciousness involve. 
their neural pathways adapt to these expanded states of consciousness, setting the stage for the development of more complex cognitive abilities. As they evolve into beings with greater cognitive capacities, they eventually give rise to a species capable of introspection, self-awareness and the profound ability to ponder the mystery of existence. Imagine if it happened not only to one ape, or one clan, or one clan, or a generation of apes, but millions and millions of times, over several millions of years. It is called epigenetic neurogenesis. With or without magic mushrooms, our ancestors were great in recognizing the patterns. It meant life or death. Is it a predator lurking in the bushes or is it a bunch of twigs and leaves combined with shadows that make it so? Today, we are good in pattern recognition. For example, we are giving names to natural formation of rocks because they remind us of a face or a figure when that rock is observed from a specific angle. This leads me to a very controversial rock sculptures of Venus found in Berkhat Ram, a place between Israel and Syria, and Tantan figurine, discovered by the river Dra near the Moroccan town of Tantan. By the way, the name Venus is not about the planet, but the Roman goddess of erotic love. The figurine of Berkhat Ram and Tantan figurine are dated back 700,000 years ago. These small statues can be also a product of natural erosion and not the creativity. Alexander Maschenak, an independent scholar and Paleolithic archaeologist, analyzed them. He is a controversial researcher. He overinterpreted many artifacts, founding numerical patterns where none exist. If he is right, though, this would challenge our assumptions about the timeline of prehistoric art. If you are not listening to this episode on Spotify or YouTube, I will publish the images on the Immortal Art Podcast Facebook page and Twitter page so you can judge for yourselves. This concludes this episode. I want to thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. I hope I inspired you. I hope you learned something. The music is performed by my friend Sebastian. You can check his band Cadavra. The link is below. Enjoy the song. Until the next time. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.